So it's the last week of our Are You Here series, and how about you? But there's just some grief that I'm working through in my heart. It's very sad, right? Exodus for 12 weeks, us and the Israelites kind of walking together, and it's all over after this. <laughs> Nobody's crying with me. Let's, uh... So here's what we're going to do today. Um, we're going to take a few minutes, and we're going to review some of the main themes of the book and some of the main ideas that we engaged uh, in our hope that their story might be instructive to us in our stories. But then after we do that little bit of review, we're going to land um, by trying to create a little space. And, and if you guys haven't noticed already in your programs, it looks very different this morning. So, so you can kind of put the programs away for now because we're not going to use them till the very end. But we're going to create a little space in which I'm going to prompt us in a time of prayer and a time of some reflection to consider what is it that through this Exodus series, through all that we've learned, what is it that God is doing in our lives and revealing to us about our lives? So where this all is going is a chance for you right here, right now in this space to prayerfully, uh, kind of in a, in a, hopefully in a holy, almost a tabernacle kind of moment to encounter God. Say, God, what are you saying to me and to us as we wrap up this Exodus story? So we'll do a little review and then we'll end with, with that prayer exercise together. Um, and I want to get us into that now. So if you were here last week, you heard me tell a story about going to a CrossFit gym. Um, and it didn't, I mean, it didn't go, it went well. It's just, I was in a lot of pain last Sunday. My shoulders, I'm happy to report, have recovered. I can lift my arms up without pain now. It's a very good thing. It's a very good thing. Um, but I, I, I went back to the CrossFit gym <laughs> last week. I, I couldn't stay away, and I went back for more. And we were doing this lift, me and the trainer. We kind of had a coaching, a one-on-one -on -one session, and he was ultimately trying to convince me to buy a membership. Um, but we were also getting a really good workout in. We were doing a coaching session, and he had me doing a type of lift called a deadlift. Now, the name alone should indicate that this is something we should stay away from, right? Like, why would you do something called a deadlift? Now, in case you're not, you know, familiar with a deadlift, which if so, well done, well done. But in case you're not, here's the general idea. There's a barbell, you know, big heavy bar, and it's on the ground, and there's weights on both sides, and it just sits there on the ground. And on the one hand, it's a very simple exercise. You just bend down, and you got to like do it right. You just bend down, and you grab the weight, and you just pick it up and then you put it back down. That's it. You just bend down, you pick it up, and you put it back down. It sounds simple. But the deadlift is part of a category of exercises referred to as Olympic lifts. And I'm not exactly sure what that means, but I think it means um, this is kind of a, a higher level type of workout. I, does it mean that the Olymp they have it in the Olympics? Is that what an Olympic lift is? That makes sense. And the reason it's an Olympic lift is because while it seems simple, as you increase weight, right, as, as the amount of weight you have that you just bend down and pick up, as the weight increases, the need for excellent form and technique also increases. And so what happens is, as the weight increases and you're doing this exercise, it's a very revealing exercise. It will make it abundantly clear to you if you have any weak spots in your muscular you know, systems. It will make it very clear if you have any uh, improper form or technique. It will make it very clear, hypothetically, that if your lower back sometimes has a history of injury and you don't have great technique, uh, it'll make it very clear that your lower back is in need of some increased strength and that your form is in need of some improvement because I hurt my lower back. And yesterday, I was walking around like this all day. I'm doing a little better now. I'm doing a little better. Uh, so if you see me at all sort of accommod you know, accommodating for my back injury, you know, know, now know why. But here's why I tell that story up front. At the weight room, while doing the deadlifts, I became uh, sort of 
made re-aware of just how much I need to strengthen my lower back, and I became aware that my technique in the deadlift is not perfect. It's maybe something far, far from perfect. The exercise I was doing revealed to me some of the areas that I was strong and things were okay, and it revealed to me some of the ways in my life that I was weak and in need of growth. And I want to give that to you up front as an image of what I hope we do together today. I hope that by reviewing the story of Exodus and then by creating a space for prayerfully reviewing our lives, I hope that today, whether you're physically in this room, whether we've always got people, you know, tuning in on the live stream with us, uh, I hope that today is a day when God reveals to us where in our lives we're strong by his spirit that he's given us gifts, we're drawing near to him, and that God might reveal to us, like my lower back, where we might be weak, not necessarily just physically, but emotionally, relationally, in our lives, in our attitudes, in our behaviors. That's my hope for us this morning. So, learn from my bad example of re-injuring my lower back, and may this be a place where wherever we're weak, wherever we're struggling, whatever has need for God to do some work on our lives, may we be attentive to him so that he might show us and grow us in those areas so that we might not fall into whatever injuries we're at risk of. Because what we know for sure is that all of us are strong and have health in some places in our lives, and all of us have some weaknesses, have some inaccuracies in our life technique, and God wants to meet us there and show that to us. So that's the image I give to you to sort of define what we're going to try to do together, and I hope and I pray that you would in God, you would engage the God who is present today, that this would not be an exercise in listening to me speak my words, but rather by looking at God's word together, this would be an exercise in us listening to the God who was present with Israel and is now still present with us today. Does that sound good? Anybody up for that? Yeah, come on, good. All right, so um, I was trying to figure out how to do a short review of the book of Exodus, and I, I wrote a whole bunch of things, but what I landed on was a short summary, kind of chapter by chapter, of the main content of Exodus. So I want to start by just reading that to you. And as I'm reading it, don't just listen, but I'd encourage you to let it prompt your memory on all of the things we've been talking about these last 11 and today 12 weeks. Because as you know, we've gone to a lot of different places, right? We've asked some pretty heady questions about what kind of a God does the Bible reveal to us? We've asked some pretty serious heart questions about how the Israelites were stuck in slavery. Where are we stuck in our own lives? Uh, we've talked about the way that God gave freedom to Israel and he wants to give freedom to us as well. So as we read this summary, I just invite you, let it prompt your memory on the things that God's been doing in your life through his word over these 12 weeks. So here's my attempt to briefly summarize 40 chapters of the book of Exodus. So it starts, when God hears the cry of the enslaved Israelites, moved by compassion, he calls Moses to join him in freeing Israel. He confronts the injustice of Egypt, frees his people from their oppression provides for their needs as a newly independent nation, and enters a committed relationship with them at Sinai. Then the people respond to this invitation to relationship. They respond to this eagerly at first, but quickly turn their backs on God. In character, God responds with both justice and mercy. God designs for Israel a means for their regular engagement with his presence in their midst, the tabernacle and the Sabbath. This further establishes the strength of their relationship and it anticipates the ways God plans to bless all nations through this people. The story ends with a sense of anticipation about God's continued journey with 
his people. I wanted to try a little harder to, to make that summary even more concise. So here was my second round attempt. In Exodus, we meet a God, and that God is named Yahweh. Yahweh is a name that indicates how God was present and is present and always will be present. And we learn that Yahweh is a God who always hears the cry of the oppressed. Once he hears the cry, he then confronts injustice. After confronting injustice, the purpose of that confrontation is to free the oppressed people who are crying out, and finally, to provide, to give all that is needed for these people to enter in a covenant relationship with him. And I'd ask you to consider, as we've been prayerfully engaging this story in our own lives and saying, where are you stuck in your life? And wherever you're stuck, we know that you don't want to stay stuck, but you, that you want to find freedom. But we also know that just like the Israelites, in that place of being stuck, you often look in all the wrong places. And that's not me being mad at you. That's just me letting you know that we're all in this boat together. We look in all the wrong places to find freedom. And God invites us to stop looking in all the wrong places and start looking in the one and only place where we can actually find freedom. And that is by looking to Him. And once we start looking to Him, we have to realize it, it needs a first-time choice to start looking to him. But all of the patterns and all of the habits of our past, we don't just sort of pick them up and toss them out, but we have to replace those old patterns with new patterns, new rhythms of purposefully engaging God's presence in our midst so that all the brokenness of our past can be replaced with habits of engaging God's presence in our midst. And so that's the whole story. That's where we've been. And as we've talked about a number of times, whether it was on the prayer banners around the room or on some of the prayer cards, which you can still add to today, um, we're gonna, we've captured digitally everything we've wrote. And so, you know, we're always looking for ways to share and celebrate with the community the things God is doing in our midst as a community. Um, but as we've gone along the way, we've been celebrating that God has been present and at work in our lives as a people. God has been doing things here in this room, in these lives, quite frankly, in the same way that God was at work in the lives of the Israelites. And that's all brought us now to the final scene of the book of Exodus. If you want, you can go in your Bibles now to Exodus chapter 40. We're going to look for just a minute at the last four verses of the whole book of Exodus. Exodus chapter 40 verses 34 through 38. And we're going to see how this very ending point kind of wraps up, but then leads forward through the end of the book of Exodus. So here we go. Um, last four verses, Exodus chapter 40, verses 34 through 38. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses could not enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled on it and the glory of the Lord had filled the tabernacle. In all the travels of the Israelites, whenever the cloud lifted from above the tabernacle, they would set out. But if the cloud did not lift, they did not set out until the day it lifted. So the cloud of the Lord was over the tabernacle by day, and fire was in the cloud by night, in the sight of all the Israelites during all their travels. I want to just mention three things about this final passage in the book of Exodus. So first of all, the cloud. You may remember we spent a long time, the whole second half of the book of Exodus was at the foot of Mount Sinai. And in a sense, we're still kind of there but there's starting to be a little movement. But the, but the whole second half of the book was at the foot of Mount Sinai. And while at the foot of Mount Sinai, God was present at the top of Mount Sinai. You might remember when John preached a few weeks ago, he showed a picture of Mount Sinai. Not that big of a mountain, at least by our, you know, Colorado standards. The Israelites likely could have seen the top of, the, of, of Mount Sinai. And so the cloud was there at the top of Mount Sinai, God's presence right there with them. And what we get here at the end of Mount Sinai 
is the presence of God, which for 20 chapters now has been right up there. The presence of God has now moved down the mountain and come to be right in the midst of the Israelites. And this is indeed a pattern we see in Scripture, is that God is always moving closer to his people. We saw that when God showed up saying, I'm going to free you from slavery. We saw that when God confronted the Egyptians uh, in their injustice, and we saw that when God provided the law, and now we see the continuation of the theme that God and his presence is always moving closer to his people. Second thing, Moses could not enter the tent. So the presence of God is now here. It's at the tabernacle. It's in the midst of God's people, but Moses could not enter the tent. You saw in the video, um, the author of that video took one of the interpretive options that Moses' inability to enter was somewhat related to the fact that the Israelites have been disobedient, that even though they've been drawing closer to God, they've also been making some silly decisions turning away from God. You remember the scene, right? They're at the foot foot of Mount Sinai. God has just rescued them from slavery. God's presence is right there in the cloud, and they're like, We don't know this God anyway. Where is he anyway? He's right there. I I take a different interpretation, uh, not just I, but lots of people, and they're both fine, and they're maybe both instructive. Um, But there's an interesting thing to notice about where we're at. See, as a brief uh, reminder of the context, the book of Exodus is the second book in the Bible, right? And, And actually, it's part of a group of five books that we often call the Pentateuch. And those five books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, those five books actually go together and are probably more like one really big book that you just can't fit conveniently into one book. So we had to break them apart. Think Lord of the Rings. It's really just one book. But you can't print a book that big. you got to break it up into three small books. And if you've read Lord of the Rings, you know that even the three small books are subdivided into even smaller books inside of them, right? Same concept. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy all go together. Why do I say that? Because we come to the book of Exodus, and what's happening right here is we're kind of getting a foreshadow. We're given some anticipation of where the story goes next. Where does the story go next? The book of Leviticus is entirely about the new tabernacle, and a new group of people called the priests who are all responsible for administering all the work of the tabernacle. And it's an interesting parallel. God's presence was on the mountain, and now God's presence has come closer to his people in the tabernacle. Similarly, when God's presence was on the mountain, only Moses would go up, talk to God, come back down go back up, talk to God, come back down. Moses was the only one who did that. But now as God's presence has come closer, there's a larger group of people. The whole priesthood is now able to go into the presence of God and come and communicate God's presence to his people. And so I think the reason Moses can't enter is to indicate a transfer from only Moses goes and talks to God to now all of the priesthood can engage God's presence in the tabernacle. Which is, again, is a theme that we see. God's presence is always moving closer to his people. And similarly, God's presence is always becoming more accessible to even more people. Both of these things foreshadow where we're actually going to go starting next week during the season of Advent when we begin our work of anticipating the coming of Christ to earth. But that's next week. I get ahead of myself. Finally, in all the travels of the Israelites, whenever the cloud lifted from above the tabernacle, the Israelites would pack up and they would follow the cloud. And this, I think, is a beautiful image of anticipation. We have to do, again, a little bit of um, work in our imagination, right? Because what we have sort of default in our heads when we think about the lives of people, is we have our current experience, right? So we all woke up this morning in some kind of a bed in in a home or an apartment or a condo that was probably built with 
you know, kiln-dried two-by-fours that have asphalt shingles on the roof, and we drove our internal combustion car engines down paved roads with stoplights to come to church. And all of that comfort and all of that structure and all that security we have built into our lives can make it difficult for us to remember what the Israelites lived like. And so we have to remember, they're living in the desert. The Bible calls it the wilderness. It might be better to call it a wasteland. They are a brand new nation, just freed from slavery, but now formed into a nation. And as a brand new nation, as you know, nations have to work hard to know how to do things like maintain a legal system, uh, ensure adequate food distribution for the whole population, handle things like sanitation. You can read in Leviticus and Deuteronomy about all of the sanitation issues that the Israelites had to work through. And apparently, there was a lot of writing necessary to make sure that was handled properly. So the Israelites are, are figuring out, what does it mean to be a nation? What does it mean to be a people? How do we organize this? How do we administrate this? How do we run this huge operation? And we're doing it in a wasteland of a desert where food isn't secure, where water isn't for certain, where we don't have all that great of a roof over our heads. But the one thing they do have, I mean, can just try for a minute to imagine what it's like to live in that place. Try to fathom how you feel waking up every morning in that situation. And from in that place, the, the one thing they have for certain is they know that every morning they wake up and they look at the tabernacle and they say, has the cloud lifted? Okay, no, the cloud hasn't lifted, so we're going to go back to our lives, trying to form a new nation, trying to carry out our daily work. We're going to go to bed, we're going to wake up, and we're going to look, has the cloud lifted? Okay, no, the cloud hasn't lifted, so we're going to go back to our lives, do our thing, go to bed, wake up, first thing, look at the tabernacle, has the cloud lifted? Oh, the cloud has lifted. Because the cloud has lifted, I know that today we're going to pack up and we're going to move and follow God. It's a, it's a whole nation whose central purpose is defined by is God moving? And wherever God's moving, that's where I'm going to follow. And it's a pretty awesome image of how to behave, how to live as God's people. So, a couple questions that I want to consider. First, why did we just study the book of Exodus? couple thoughts on that. First, we studied the book of Exodus, like I just said, because Exodus is, in a sense, our prototype of what kind of a God God is. And I say prototype because, like we've talked about, everything that was begun here was just the beginning, but it was all pointing towards an even greater revelation of God's presence that we will find, that we will discover in the future. And that is exactly where we're actually going to go in Advent, is we're going to look at the God we met in Exodus, and how all the things God began in Exodus, he brings to fulfillment in his coming to earth as the baby Christ. So we studied Exodus because the themes of Exodus are just central, and they trace themselves throughout all scripture, God revealing himself more fully all throughout the way. We've also talked about how, uh, you know, the way we think about God, the way we understand God, shapes the way we have a relationship with God. And we wrestled with some heavy questions, right? Is God good? When God does the things he does in the book of Exodus, are we okay with that? And we wrestled through how our modern assumptions are not the same as the ancient assumptions, and how sometimes we read stories and go, is, is God a monster? But actually, the, the ancients would have experienced the same things and said, this is the most just and merciful image of God we've ever encountered. So we've done all this work, and we've learned all these things, and, and that's all really well and good. But is that enough? Is that really the point of it all? I mean, you could take the same question, and you could back it out a little bit and go, why do we, what is the point of learning about Scripture 
at all. Like, why would it be that we study Scripture, that we understand the language and the history and the culture? If you're somebody who memorizes Scripture, I know a lot of you do. If you don't, you should try it. Why do we memorize Scripture? What's the point of getting all this knowledge and getting all this information into our heads? Is that really what this is all about? And some of you are like, no, Carl, that's not what it's all about. And nobody ever said it was all about. But I have to put out the hypothetical question to make the point. So, is the goal of 12 weeks on Exodus just to get a bunch of knowledge and feel good that we know the Bible really well? Here's the, here's the image that came to my mind as I was thinking about how to, how to sort of present this. Um, just a few weeks ago, actually it was a couple months ago, um, we decided we're going to paint a set of bookshelves in our living room. And I was being, I mean, I was really on top of things, right? So I, I went and I bought the paint and I pulled out the paint brushes and checked them and they were still, you know, I'd washed them last time so they weren't hard as a rock and I got my drop cloths and I, and I bought the paint and I brought it home and I took it all and I set it on the living room floor so that when it was time to paint, I was totally ready. And I have in my head a very clear image of that little pile of drop cloths and paint brushes and paint buckets on my living room floor. And the reason I have that image so clearly in my head is because it sat there for a little while. It actually sat there for a couple of weeks. I'm sure none of you have ever experienced anything like this. I'm sure there's no other husband in the room who's ever been like, yeah, honey, I'll take care of that right away. Here's the thing about having um, all of the paint supplies ready to go sitting next to the bookshelves and what it has to do with our question for this morning. Knowledge without application is like paint in a can. It hasn't served its purpose. I don't care how ready I am to paint the bookshelves. They are not painted until I put the paint on the shelf. The point of the paint is actually to get on the shelf. I mean, it looks nice in the can. You know, they bake the very nicely decorated cans these days, but the paint is a failure until I've got it onto the bookshelf. And so it is for us right now. We've just learned a ton. We have a, a huge amount of great knowledge about who God is as he revealed himself to us in the book of Exodus. But that knowledge, unless it is applied to our lives, it's like painting a can. It's not fulfilled its purpose. And that's not just my idea, but it turns out that that's actually what we see and what we hear time and time and time again in the pages of Scripture. Here's just three examples from three of, you know, three major authors in the New Testament. So this is James. Um, he's the brother of Jesus. He's one of the core leaders in the early church. And James actually makes this one of the central themes. This is one of the core themes in the whole book of James. He says, hey, do not merely listen to the word, that is the word of God, do not merely listen to the word, and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. So our image was, oh great, I've got a can of paint. Look at the shelves are done. No, 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 no. Until you put the paint on the shelf, they're not done. James's image is similar, but different. You look in the mirror and you go, whoa, I look terrible. You guys would never do that. I sometimes look in the mirror. My hair gets out of control. And I look in the mirror and I'm like, whoa, I got to do something about that. No, that is to completely miss the point. Or here's another one of our New Testament authors, the Apostle Paul, who planted most of the first churches around the whole ancient world. And Paul started a church in Galatia. And the Galatians, they were wrestling through some really heady issues of theology, who is God, and of practical application. How do we go about worshiping God? And they were getting in some arguments. I mean, it's hard to believe. Jesus followers getting in arguments with one another 
Never happened again after this in Galatia. Um, so Paul is, yeah, that was a joke, thank you, because uh, apparently we do still get in fights. Paul is helping mediate this argument through the letter, and the conclusion to Paul's whole argument about, well, do we do things this way or that way? Do we believe this about God or that about God? Paul's conclusion to the whole argument is, the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through Here's another one of the apostles, the apostle John, in one of the three little letters that he wrote. And John sums it up in a beautiful way and says, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. What John says is what we're thinking about right now. Everything that you know about God as you've learned through the book of Exodus, that only becomes a true knowledge. The knowledge is fulfilled, completed. Its purpose is made whole only when we put it to work in our lives. And I hope and I pray and, and, I, and I hope you hear it, not as a way to say to heap shame or guilt or pressure upon us, but rather as an invitation to say that the God who was at work in Israel wants you to join him like Moses joined him, like the Israelites joined him. He wants us to join him in that same work. And so we met a God named Yahweh, and Yahweh is a God who always hears the cry confronts injustice, frees the oppressed, and provides for a covenant relationship with him. And all of that work that God did in the lives of the Israel, all of the things that God has been doing here in your life, in our midst, through this community, all of those things, God does not say, hey, look at me, I'm doing all these things. You guys just sit back, relax. But rather, God says, all of these things that I'm doing I invite you to join. God always invites us to join him in his work, to take the knowledge we have about what he's doing and put it to work in our lives. And so the question then becomes, why do we study the book of Exodus? What do we do with all this stuff that we've just learned? The question is, how, in what specific practical, actionable, daily life kind of ways, how are you living that work of God? How are you living it out in your life? Where is it showing up? What's it doing? Where is God inviting you to come another step forward with him? Like I said, in just a minute, um, I'm going to have you guys pull your programs back out, and I want to create a space for us to really purposefully reflect on that question. With all the knowledge we've gained about God, with all that God's been doing in our midst, how is God inviting you to not just know it, but live it in our lives? And here's the way um, I, I want to do that. See, it turns out that as a church, this idea that everything that God is doing, he invites us to join it, this is actually baked right into the very heart of why we exist as a church community. I did this last week, but grab your programs again. Flip it over to the back, and on the top of the back of the program is our church mission statement. You'll see there, it says, Centennial Covenant exists to glorify God. Just like the Israelites at the foot of Mount Sinai and with the tabernacle, we exist to glorify God, to make great the goodness of his presence. And how do we do that? We do it in four ways. One, by following Jesus, the fulfillment of God's presence in our midst. Two, we follow Jesus, not on our own, not by ourselves, but on a shared journey. And that shared journey of following Jesus, if we fully engage it, we're going to find that it's not a static journey. But we glorify God by following Jesus on a shared journey of transformation. God wants to change some things for the better in our lives. And that transformation always leads us in his mission to our broken world 
And just like the Israelites were invited to join God, so also we join with God in his mission and his work that he is doing in the world. One of the ways we sort of shorthand talk about that is we say this is a, this is a four-dimensional, this is a holistic vision of the life of following God. It's not just one simple small thing, but rather it's something that encapsulates all different areas of our lives. And our sort of shorthand for it is we say it's an up, with, in, and out kind of life. And those aren't four separate areas, but it's almost like a, I think of it as a water wheel. As the presence of God is pouring in, it's going to move us in an upward direction to encounter God. It's going to move us in a withward direction in community with one another. It's going to move us in an inward direction, experiencing transformation in our lives. And eventually, it's going to pour out, overflowing in love to the world around us. We've used a lot of different language to talk about that, but here's yet another way. What does it look like to live this kind of holistic vision of discipleship? It looks like vulnerable worship, where we bring to God who we really are. Not a fake self, not a false self, not a pretend self, but we're vulnerable. We say, God, this is what's really going on in my life. From vulnerable worship, we can step into authentic community considering who are the people in my life that I don't have to put on that facade or put on that show that the world seems to want me to put on so often, but I can say, no, I'm just, this is how I really am, and this is what's really going on. And when we do that, encountering God, engaging community, we can believe that through God's presence, we will experience life, transformation, God changing us for the better into who we were made to be, and all of that should and will, and let's be honest, it does pour out in active love to the community around us. So here's what I want to do now. Uh, I'm going to have the worship team come on back up. Um, Open your programs. You'll see I've I've put space. You can write those things down in the program. I'll just leave them up there for a minute. Um, Here's what I want you to consider. The worship team uh, is going to sing the first verse of the hymn, Yet Not I, But Through Christ in Me. We've sung it a couple times over the past few days. After they sing that first verse, they're just going to go for the next couple verses into um, an instrumental music time. They'll be playing, no songs, no words on the screen. Um, You'll get to hear some of our brass, uh, beautiful playing again. During that time, would you do this? Would you take the space on the paper Would you put pen to paper, and with prayer, would you say, God, show me where you've gifted me, and where I'm strong, and where my form is good in life, and I'm drawing closer to you, and God, like Carl learned that his lower back's a little weak, would you show me, God, in the up, the with, the in, and the out, if things are a little weak in my life, may God show us, not to condemn us or criticize us, but to invite us to grow stronger in him, however that is. Would you pray with me? God, in this space that we set for you through this one verse of singing, but then through a a purposeful time to encounter you, I pray, God, that like I learned in the gym, would you show us, no matter what area of life it is, if it's relationally, if it's in our thought lives, if it's in our attitudes and habits and behaviors, if it's professionally, if it's in the home or if it's at work, God, would you show us both a confirmation of where we're strong in our relationship with you and and an invitation of where our weakness can be healed by you. May it be so, I pray. Amen. Amen.